My name is Tom Gilligan. I'm the Dean of the Macomb School of Business. Welcome, everyone. Uh, please continue eating uh, while I speak, and, um, and you'll be treating me just like the students treat me. They ignore everything I say. So, uh, Well, again, I want to thank uh, everyone for coming today. I've heard this, mor this morning's events were wonderful, and I know this afternoon's events will be wonderful as well. I hope you're getting a lot of value out of the interaction. I want to thank, firstly, everybody responsible for producing today's uh, Venture Expo. In particular, I want to thank Rob Adams, the uh, professor in the Macomb School of Business and the director of our Texas Venture Labs for putting this on. Rob, could you please stand and let us give you a round of applause? Thanks, Rob. Um, Rob has just done a tremendous amount of work but behind the scenes, and more importantly, the leadership he, that he has exhibited and um, brought to date to press venture ideas at UT and McCombs has been tremendous, and we really owe him a great deal of gratitude for anything that happens today and beyond in that area. I also want to recognize uh, uh, the students who have helped Rob put this event on and helped develop the Texas Venture Labs concept. Uh, one of the secrets at the McCombs School of Business is that uh, professors occasionally will have an idea, but anything that happens is always done by students, and the student leadership and efforts that take place at McCombs are tremendous. So I'd like to ask the associates of Texas Venture Labs who have worked with Rob on this project to please stand and have us recognize them with a round of applause. Thank you all for all your efforts on, on our behalf. Well, now's a good time to take stock of initiatives on in entrepreneurship, innovation, and commercialization, and today's expo affords us that opportunity. Obviously, entrepreneurship and technology commercialization are important complements to any major research university. Many of the most innovative places in the United States cluster around such universities, such as Silicon Valley and Stanford, and Boston's Route 128 corridor around Harvard Medical School and MIT, encouraging the application of ideas, of the ideas and science created at a great university accelerates economic growth and prosperity in surrounding local and regional economies and often well beyond that. Promoting the productive use of knowledge created at UT Austin is an important goal for all of us here today. This lunchtime panel, I think, will discuss the role and importance of entrepreneurship and technology commercialization at the University of Texas. In particular, we will focus today on how the university is encouraging the launching and funding of startups with a coordinated approach that helps ensure that viable ventures are identified, vetted, mentored, and supported through the early stages of development. Beyond our core scientific academic schools and centers, the resources and processes being applied to technology commercialization at UT Austin are substantial and include the Office of Technology Commercialization, the Austin Technology Incubator, the Institute for Creative Capitalism, and now Texas Venture Labs. At the McCombs School of Business, too, we try to accelerate, accelerate the process of new product or service development in several ways. Like other units on campus, we participate in cross-campus interdisciplinary collaboration to support venture startups that require expertise in entrepreneurship, business, technology, science, and law. These efforts bring together faculty, students, and our friends in the venture environment in ways that often are as unique as the ideas that we are attempting to commercialize. The Texas Venture Labs, about which you will learn more this afternoon, is our latest example. The mission of Texas Venture Labs is to bring students from across campus together to work under the supervision of faculty and experienced, on, and experienced entrepreneurs to help commercialize ideas developed at UT Austin and the surrounding locales. The goals of Texas Venture Lab are twofold. First, to utilize faculty expertise at McCombs and student efforts across campus to foster innovation during the formative stages of the product or service development process. We all know that this process is fraught with hazards that can be minimized through early and clever assessments and hard work. Our hope is that Texas Venture Labs can increase the likelihood that nascent ideas get a better chance of reaching fruition. A second goal of Texas Venture Labs is to better train the students that pass through UT Austin in the art of managing innovation and creativity more broadly. At least in business, the requirements of modern management are changing rapidly. 
Potential employers are increasingly attracted to students who can manage change and add value, either through process or product slash service innovation, in complex organizations. Even for students that do not end up as entrepreneurs or venture capitalists, the experiences possible through the activities conducted within Texas Venture Labs will serve them well throughout their professional careers. I want to acknowledge the benefactors and advisors for our Texas Venture Lab program and thank them for their generous and dedicated support. I want to call them out by name, and if you could stand when I call your name, and at the end, if we could acknowledge them with applause, I would appreciate it. Shane Brisbane, I don't know if Shane's here. Bill Gurley, I know Bill's not here. Daniel Nelson, Robert Reeves, yay. Bo Ross, Bo is here, thanks Bo. and Brian Stolle. Uh, these individuals have been instrumental in the launch of Texas Venture Labs, and we look forward to a long and, and productive relationship with you all. Thanks so much for everything you've done to date. I would also like to say just how much fun uh, and, and enjoyment I've had working with my colleagues on this and other projects related to entrepreneurship. Uh, my fellow deans, Greg Finvez, is fun to work with. Uh, Marianne Rankin, uh, Sharon Mosier, uh, the Jackson School of Geosciences, has, have really uh, devoted a great deal of efforts on this project. Uh, Richard Miller, who will speak later, and Vice President Sanchez, um, Vice President for Research, has done a lot to advance the interest of commercialization here at the school. John Butler at IC Squared, Isaac Vargas at ATI, a uh, great group of people to work with, all dedicated and on the same page trying to commercialize technology here at UT. I also want to thank uh, Bill Powers. Bill's not here yet. I think he's going to speak later on. Uh, he's uh, brought a great deal of leadership and inspiration to all of us trying to push along entrepreneurship at UT, and I want to thank him for doing that. I also want to thank today's attendees, uh, many of whom are graduates of the McComb School of Business and the University of Texas at Austin. I appreciate your support and encouragement in these activities, and I, looking, I look forward to working with you to continue to enhance economic development and growth, both of our student, uh, state and in, in our community by virtue of technology commercialization. Thanks for attending today, and thanks for all that you continue to do to make this possible. You can clap for yourself. Well, again, I, I want to, I'm going to join you for, these afternoon, for the afternoon festivities. I know it's going to be a good time. I want to thank you again for coming. Uh, I would now like to introduce Greg Finvez. Is that right? Greg's going to come up and talk. Greg is the dean of the Cockerell School of Engineering. Thanks, Greg. Well, thank you, Tom. I'm going to keep my remarks uh, short for two reasons. One is the main speakers uh, are following me, so I want to make sure that they have enough time uh, to give their presentations. And the second reason is I left my voice in northern Michigan uh, with the winter weather. So, uh, so if you can't hear me, it's, uh, it's because of my voice. Well, thank you very much for attending uh, this uh, inaugural event for Texas Venture Labs. This is a very exciting time at the University of Texas. Uh, I am very pleased to be working with Macomb School of Business, uh, with our other schools and colleges, and as uh, Tom said, with President Powers and his entire leadership team in changing what we're doing at UT Austin in a very, very positive way. Speaking for the School of Engineering, <clears throat> a technology commercialization and innovation are the, the core of what we do. And it's important for three reasons, and those three reasons are the mission uh, that we have in engineering, and I'd say the mission university-wide. So what is the, the first mission? Well, it's education. And in the Cockerell School of Engineering, our view is we're never going to be able to educate every engineer the state of Texas needs, the United States needs. Where we get the most leverage is by educating future leaders. And that could be in a variety of contexts in, uh, based on an engineering education. And it is really important for educating leaders uh, that we bring that innovation process into our curriculum and into the activities and the opportunities our engineering students have within the School of Engineering and throughout the, the broader university. The skills that are important in technology commercialization, identifying needs, coming up with ideas to address those needs, creating technologies based on those ideas, 
identifying markets uh, that those needs represent, and building resources to satisfy those markets with new technology is really the crux of entrepreneurship. And that innovation cycle is important not just for our students who may go on to form startups, but more likely are going to work in larger companies and then may start their own company. But even large companies today are looking for, uh, for employees that can identify needs, create ideas, develop technology, identify markets, and <clears throat> build the resources. That happens in every business enterprise. And we need to get that into our undergraduate engineering education. And it can't just be done in engineering. We have to work with business. Uh, with communications, with liberal arts. This is a, a very comprehensive process if engineers are truly going to be leaders. And, and one of the, <clears throat> I think, the most important aspects of the Texas Venture Labs is that it is giving us the tools and the platform for creating this kind of educational environment for our students. Our second mission is research. We are a great research university. Uh, I think after MIT, the University of Texas at Austin, does more sponsored research than any other university in the United States that doesn't have a medical school. Medical schools uh, do change the statistics. We're doing about $600 million of sponsored research a year. That's a huge amount. My theory in, uh, through my entire career in universities has been that the really great researchers understand that need, idea, technology process of innovation. And the really great researchers, when they're deciding where are they going to spend their valuable time, what problems are they going to spend their valuable time on in engineering, are the ones who understand what the needs are. Because that's going to help them prioritize where they're going to be doing their research, and ultimately where they can have the most impact of their research. And that's why technology commercialization in an engineering research enterprise is so important. It is a crucial feedback mechanism to our faculty about what are the important problems and how should they spend, spend their time. And as the university now is uh, looking at improving and making some dramatic improvements in the culture and the processes and the policies for technology commercialization, that is going to have a very positive benefit on the research enterprise taking place in engineering and, and university-wide. And the third mission, uh, I think, is also something that we, we tend to overlook. And I, I, it goes by various names, but I call it distributing knowledge, the knowledge that we're creating at the university through research, that we're educating our students with. We need to disseminate that out to society. And the traditional academic approach to dissemination, very important, that is not going to change, is open literature, scholarly publications. And, and that, as I said, will not change. But we also have an important responsibility to identify the innovations that just putting them in the open literature won't do anything. And there are many ideas that if you publish them in a paper, nothing will happen. And so we do have a responsibility to identify those innovations and work to commercialize them, protect them, create the economic value uh, that's coming out of the knowledge created at, at, uh, developed at the university. And that is an important way that we pay back society for uh, the large investment that they make in public higher education here in Texas. And this is something that, uh, uh, that the University of Texas needs to do a better job. And we're putting the pieces in place, the players in place, uh, the organizations in place, and the culture in place to be able to do that. And what are those uh, changes? Well, you've heard about some of them today. You'll hear about the rest of them uh, after, after uh, I speak and this afternoon. Uh, number one, Texas Venture Labs. I want to thank uh, Rob Adams for developing this concept, right? Start out with an idea. Uh, start out with a need, actually. There was an idea, and now this is our, quote, commercialization of the Texas Venture Labs. And it's been a great six months uh, since it officially launched. And the Cockrell School of Engineering is very pleased to be working with Rob, uh, with Tom Gilligan, and the entire Macomb School and our other schools and colleges in creating the Texas Venture Labs and as the platform for developing, uh, de developing these ideas in education, research, and commercialization. And the second is the major changes taking place in our 
arm that deals with technology commercialization, the Office of Technology Commercialization. You heard from Richard Miller this morning. You're going to speak in a, in a few minutes. And <clears throat> I've got to tell you, I had Richard come to a Cockrell School of Engineering faculty meeting a couple weeks ago. He gave a great presentation. And after that faculty meeting, a, a longtime faculty member at UT came up to me and said, well, I've been at the University of Texas for 15 years, and I have never heard anybody talk like that at UT. And that was a very positive comment, by the way, Richard. <clears throat> and so it is it's so exciting to have, have, have Richard here, and, uh, because the, the, our interface with, uh, with investors, with uh, uh, patent protection, uh, with the commercial world has to go through OTC, and we need an OTC that is going to enable us to accomplish our threefold mission. And the third, uh, third uh, change taking place, and then I'll, I'll conclude my remarks, in the School of Engineering, but really the University of Texas is an announcement uh, that we made a, um, about a week or so ago uh, that Bob Metcalf is going to be coming to the University of Texas as a professor of innovation in the School of Engineering. Uh, some of you may know Bob, some of you may have heard of him by his reputation, uh, co-inventor of the Ethernet when he was at Xerox Park, uh, <clears throat> went on to found 3Com, the first computer networking company, and for the past decade or so has been a partner of Polaris Ventures in Boston. And Bob was looking for the next change in his long and illustrious career, and he chose Austin and the University of Texas to be a professor of innovation. And as Bob says, he's going to go meta on innovation. What makes innovation work and what doesn't make it work? And we are going to be tremendous beneficiaries of Bob uh, being here. He's going to start in January of 2011. And I think he's going to be a real catalyst with all the other changes going on, Texas Venture Labs, OTC uh, programs in our departments and our schools. So it is a very exciting time at the University of Texas, and I'm really pleased that we're ha you're having this expo and you're all here uh, as we just get this going. So thank you very much for attending, and thanks for all your support at the University of Texas. I'm sorry. Uh, Jeff, am I supposed to introduce somebody? Okay, so with that, let me introduce Dr. Richard Miller. You may have heard of him this morning, but uh, Richard is uh, the Chief Commercialization Officer of the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you, Greg, for those extremely generous remarks. I was a little nervous about where you were going with that discussion since sometimes I've been accused of using foul language, so when you said I've... I, <laughs> Uh, I've never heard anybody speak like that. I was a little bit worried. Uh, but no, I didn't recall using any foul language in that, in that conference. But I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak at the engineering school. So um, I wanted to, I have so much to talk about. Uh, I don't know if I can do it in the, in the 10 or 15 minutes, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. Um, first of all, I wanna tell you what, uh, who I am and why I'm here. Some of this is redundant to what I talked about this morning. Um, I'm a physician. Uh, I trained in medical oncology and cancer research. I'm mostly a lab guy. Uh, I love science and technology and medicine. And after a long time looking at the University of Texas Austin, uh, who I'd worked with over the past uh, nearly 20 years, I convinced myself that there was an awesome opportunity here because of the depth, breadth, and scope of technology and science. Basically, for me, coming here was about really, really great science and the opportunity to bring it together and do some really special things. Of course, I interacted with faculty and deans and students uh, and had personal experience working with the University of Texas uh, over the years. So the primary reason I'm here is because there's great science and technology. The second reason uh, I came here is because as I started to think about what I wanted to do next, managing a company day to day wasn't that exciting. I'd kind of done that. Uh, frankly, dealing with employees gets to be kind of a burden. Uh, as a CEO of companies, you're, you're always sort of dealing with the problems and not really the fun stuff. And so it, it, it didn't really feel that good to me anymore. So I thought that our country now, obviously with uh, global recession, high unemployment, uh, academic technology transfer becomes of paramount importance to our country. Uh, never before has there been such a challenge and such a demand for universities to step up and change the way they do things, become more aggressive, 
uh, more active in translating the great science and technology to, to prosperity and, and, and things that benefit society. So for me, it was, it was a challenge of the great science and the opportunity. Um, so for Office of Technology Commercialization, as I looked at that opportunity and as I started to uh, think about what was going on here, I realized that, um, well, we, at the University of Texas, we do things pretty much in the Office of Technology Commercialization as they're done in most universities across the country. Uh, we encourage faculty to file disclosures. We submit file patents for them. Um, companies come in, we negotiate licenses. Uh, and frankly, we get really good at that. Um, we, as I said this morning on one of my slides, we filed 300 patent applications in uh, 2010 fiscal year. We did 50 licensing agreements. Uh, we uh, uh, star started 32 companies in three years. So that all sounds great. So in terms of process, we're really good and, and, and most universities are really good. But really, the opportunity was how do we do this better? Because when you look at the output of all those patents filed and all those startups and all those licensing agreements, we actually don't have that much to show for it, nor do most other universities. And that's because we're not thinking about it right. So fortunately, um, this is a propitious time at the University of Texas, Austin, because Texas Venture Labs, Austin Technology Incubator, and, and hopefully uh, what I would like to do at the OTC forms a ecosystem now where we can really start to change things, we can really start to build some momentum, and really start to get aggressive by things. I was uh, struck when I first came here, and I made a slide, I was giving a presentation over the chemistry department, and my first slide uh, was, you know, what starts here changes the world, and somebody said, you maybe you don't want to use that, people are cynical about it, but I actually really do think that it is a good logo, and I do think what starts here could change the world and what we're doing. So I kind of like that logo, even though it might sound a little bit like a cliche. So here's the problems that, that we have at the university. They're, they're both problems and opportunities. I think that the major problem we have is we're, we're almost too good at research and, and education. We have such a diverse scope of technology, it's unbelievable. Let me just give you a, a couple of quick examples. Let's just talk about a few of our success stories. So our su most successful commercialization um, um, program uh, was uh, the glucose uh, monitor developed by Adam Heller, a brilliant guy, a really nice man. I've met him a few times now. I've gotten to know him, really spectacular person. So Adam's discovery led to the, a glucose monitor that, you know, you just got to stick it in your skin, get a tiny speck of blood, you got your glucose. That's a real breakthrough. Change the practice of medicine because, as you know, diabetics need to give themselves insulin to control their glucose, and this made life a lot more pleasant and easier for them. And so um, Adam started a company called, in 1996, late 90s, called um, uh, Therasense. It was located in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and um, in 2004 or so, that company was acquired by Abbott for $1.4 billion. Uh, interestingly, the University of Texas at Austin had no equity in that, in that deal. Uh, now, it does have a nice royalty, and in fact, that deal is our number one producer of revenue in the Office of Technology Commercialization. Uh, it accounts for over 40% of our revenue. It's six million out of about 14 million. Uh, unfortunately, that deal, uh, the patent on that expires in 2014, so that's you know, going to drop uh, precipitously. Um, but that's glucose and sort of a biotech, biomedical product. On the other end of the spectrum, our second most prolific product is software uh, vibrational analysis. Uh, Jeff Benninghoff is the inventor. It's a non-exclusive license to a small company in Germany. It's uh, every car manufacturer in the world uses this software because when they design a new car, they use it to determine vibration and they fix in aerodynamics and, and things like that. I understand it's also used in the aircraft industry, but vibration and noise are really, you know, obviously big consumer and marketing concerns. And so this is a technology that generates over $2 million a year, and it's, again, one of our most things. So just think about this. On one hand, we've got, uh, we've got you know, glucose, we've got software using some multi-layered algorithms, which I, I wish I could explain to you, but I can't. Um, and, and it's just so hard to, to deal with the scope of, of, 
of inventions, or the breadth of inventions. Uh, another issue we have is that many of these inventions come in really, really early, and you know they're scientifically, they're great, but the problem has yet to be defined for which, they're, which they, they may solve. And one of the reasons I think it's so great to have these ecosystems with all this activity is that we can start to bring other, other uh, ideas and other viewpoints. Uh, because as you know in a company, what makes a company really great as or different, I should say, than a university lab is university investigators uh, get rewarded for being independent and doing things well and getting their own grants and writing their own papers and things like that. Of course, in a company, what we do that's special is we bring multiple disciplines to bear on problems, and that gives us some leverage. So, so I think that um, the, um, the opportunity uh, to, to bring in all the different viewpoints uh, here at a university and what's going on now is, is really pretty special. So the other challenge we have is we need to manage our, our intellectual property a little bit better. Um, rather than filing 300 patents a year, we need to figure out how to be a little bit more selective, uh, do a little bit more diligence up front, get a little bit more scientific uh, uh, input on these things, get a little bit more legal input on these things, and be a little bit more strategic in how we uh, draft and file our patents, things like uh, prior art and competition uh, and claim language, the things that we really don't pay much attention to really become important because if you're ever going to commercialize these things, whether it's Texas Venture Labs or ATI or OTC, that's a lot of initials there, um, it doesn't matter if the patents aren't strong. They need to be really strong because investors, especially in these very, very high-tech areas now, are really worried about, about that kind of stuff, as they should be. So the good news is we can fix all that. That's easy to fix. It just changes a little bit uh, uh, how we operate um, the companies or, or, the, or the OTC. I already slipped there, Freudian slip. Uh, now, so, but how do we address the main problem? So we have to, we have to stop thinking that venture capitalists are going to swoop in here one day or, you know, Merck is going to come in here someday and suddenly they're going to be licensed on our stuff and paying us a lot of money. Of course, that ain't going to happen. Um, they've become so risk averse now. They've moved so far downstream. They're, not, uh, at least in pharma, they are not doing research anymore. They're not. Uh, and, and I can tell you that the, 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 the evidence for that is the fact that there were 30 large pharmaceutical companies in 1990 and now there's six. So clearly they can't do as much research. They can't afford it, they haven't done, as, uh, done very well. Two thirds of the drugs in the pipeline now in pharma are from um, uh, small companies. So, so we're not gonna get bailed out by large companies and the big venture firms. So we're gonna have to find ways to fund these companies, start these companies, and transfer this technology ourselves, And the Texas Venture, Venture Lab Initiative, I know things that Greg Fenvis is trying to do in engineering, uh, and I think some of the things that we're thinking about doing at OTC together really create an ecosystem that starts to feed off of each other. So this is not a new idea, and I said this, I told the story this morning, but I'll tell it again, I know there's some new people here. So um, last year was the, uh, what, 150th anniversary of Darwin. And Darwin, of course, was one of the greatest scientists ever. And um, uh, in the voyage of the Beagle, that's you know, the ship he took all around the world and took copious notes and read, led to his, his ideas and, and discoveries about um, evolution and so forth. So Darwin recognized that uh, in the middle of the ocean, he was in the Indian Ocean at the time, that there wasn't very much life. Not much was happening. Fish would go by once in a while, but not very, not, not very diverse. Um, but when he got over to these coral reef, he noticed it was teeming with life. All kinds of different species and things. And he asked a very interesting question. So why is that? Why is it I go like 50 yards out there, I've got nothing, and over here there's all this life and all this activity? And um, as smart as he was, he figured it out, even though he didn't have a microscope, he certainly didn't know what DNA was or anything like that. He didn't even know what genetics was at the time, although he drew a nice little tree about this. So Darwin figured out that these life forms were living off of each other, and that once you had this critical mass, uh, a symbiosis would take place, and one life form's excretory product would be another, another life form's food. Sorry for the analogy. Maybe that's what Greg was talking about. <laughs> um, 
But that's what we're trying to do here. So Texas Venture Labs, ATI, OTC, the more activity we can, productive activity that we can get going on, the more ecosystem and the more successful we get. So when you think about um, Darwin's uh, dilemma, which is what it's referred to as Darwin's paradox, when you think about that, that's really what we do in a society. I mean, cities uh, uh, develop because of the symbiosis, work, agriculture, whatever. Cities grow because of people working together. Um, and so we're really, really, uh, we really do that uh, all the time. So the, the, the great thing about what's going on now here at UT is the fact that we now have several different new innovative forces that are coming to bear. Now, which one's going to work the best? I mean, I, I don't know. It's a matter of definition. What uh, I, I'd say it, it feeds on itself. It, it, the, you build off each other. Um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, recycling of uh, lead from batteries is a great business for the recyclers, but it's another man's uh, junk. Uh, and so it's all about perspective and strategy and how you take things. Um, Texas Venture Labs uh, may benefit from me looking at a technology and maybe not even liking it, uh, or they, or vice versa. So I think that that dialogue and that critical thing, that's what, what you really need. And that's what makes these ecosystems in Silicon Valley, in my opinion, in Silicon Valley or in, in Boston, whatever. When you go down Sand Hill Road in California and one venture capitalist throws you out and then the second one loves you, in my case, it was the first one, the second one, the third, the fourth, the fifth. <laughs> but I'm very uh, perseverant. So, um, so, so that's, that's the excitement here. So, so the bottom line is the combination of really strong science and creating now this ecosystem to leverage and exploit it. Rob, how much time do I have? Of course, I, I can actually uh, give a lecture on monoclonal antibodies or... Uh, <laughs> Uh, immunosuppressor cells or whatever. Okay. All right. So in conclusion, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank Rob and, and uh, Dean Gilligan and, Ev and Dean Fenvis for, for uh, letting me part, be part of their groups and speak to their faculty and, and really uh, uh, get a chance to collaborate. Uh, and I want to take advantage of that. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. First of all, good afternoon. Uh, for many of you, it's welcome back. My name is Rob Adams. I just wanted to get up and uh, spend some time with you just reviewing what's been going on with Venture Labs uh, since for the last six months since we really got started. Um, many of you were here at that point in time and we laid out a plan to take a system that had worked on campus for several companies and expand it. And just like any other startup, we wanted to make sure we scaled it correctly, made it work, continued to see success, and then start expanding it. So what my goal here today in, in this session is really just give you an update on what's happened since then. Uh, the good news is a lot has happened. Uh, we've had tremendous success, and probably the even better news is I promise to be brief. So first of all, the overarching message I want you to walk away with is just the incredible uh, reception Texas Venture Labs has had on many fronts. Um, for all of you in the business community, a majority of you in the room here today, this is just evidence of that. Um, the investment world, we've been very well received, both from a, a contributor standpoint, which, which Dean Gilgan covered, uh, as well as the investment world continuing to put money into our companies, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And really, mostly on the UT campus, where sort of the cross-campus reach of the program has been rapid. We are uh, spending a lot of time with the School of Engineering, a lot of time with the School of Law, College of Natural Sciences, and the Business School. And all that has been going very well. I know at each of your tables there are associates from Texas Venture Labs. They represent all those schools. We work together on teams, cross-functional teams, and uh, spend a lot of time with these companies. And today, TVL is running this event, but I really want to emphasize how our goal, particularly for the business community that's here, is to cover the new ventures that are available on the University of Texas campus. 
This morning we heard uh, not only Richard Miller speak, but we also heard about opportunities for commercialization, for technologies coming out of the Office of Technology commercialization. Uh, we also had Isaac Barkas speak, who runs the Austin Technology Incubator, and saw a number of the companies they are working with that are ready for funding at this point in time. So Texas Venture Labs has worked very closely with these organizations over the last eight months to advance entrepreneurship on campus. These have been wonderful partnerships along with the many others we've, uh, we've participated with. Um, additionally, we've re worked with and recruited more than 70 students from the schools I mentioned. Uh, again, engineering, law, and natural sciences. These were, uh, we, we started this process in March. We put these students to work in September, the first full semester we've had them. And it's important to note that this was drawn from pools of hundreds of applicants. Um, and as we continue this into the next semester, we have had even more grassroots acceptance on the student part. So we've been active with 10 companies, which I'll highlight on the screen here. Uh, since we kicked off uh, the actual classroom part of this in September. So currently, if, uh, these companies on the list here, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, those are companies where we're working with pretty much raw, raw ideas. Uh, those are either technologies coming off the campus, coming from OTC, coming from Greg Fenvis in the School of Engineering, coming from the business school, or represented by companies that were founded by current or recent graduates of the University of Texas. If you look in the uh, bottom right-hand corner, these are opportunities that have come to us from the Austin community, typically with some type of University of Texas affiliation. Uh, interestingly, the ones on the bottom right-hand corner, those five are all in the process of actively, actively raising funds since the, during the period of time we've been working with them. And interestingly, as of today, all five of these companies have either written or verbal offers for outside investors to put money in. And if you're aware of what the economic situation is today, um, that's quite an accomplishment in this environment. So hats off to those companies and the teams that have worked with them. Some of the other accomplishments we've, we've uh, been able to successfully execute since getting going, including uh, managing the Central Texas Angel Network, Randall Crowder, who many of you know, has come on as our first full-time postdoc, full-time employee. Uh, he was instrumental in creating that relationship and continuing to nurture that, as well as doing other entrepreneurial things in the community. We've been able to host this Venture Expo event, which is obviously a one-day event. You're going to even, even hear more from us in the May, in the May time frame. We're going to have a, an event called Venture Week, where we intend to also bring out to the public all the technologies, all the opportunities that are available on the campus as well as hold our international investment competition, which we've been holding for years, as well as other many other uh, entrepreneurial-oriented events. So obviously, all this couldn't have been accomplished without all, all of you in the audience here today. Uh, many, of a, many of you are business partners, many of you are University of Texas affiliates, many of you are alums from the university. And to all of you, I want to say on behalf of Venture Labs, a sincere thank you for all your support. And for just a minute before I uh, invite President Bill Powers to come up and speak, let me just take a minute and, and uh, publicly recognize the original backers of Texas Venture Labs. Um, the, there are five people that Dean Gilligan covered. I'd like to particularly recognize Bo Ross and Robert Reeves who are here in the, at the table here today. Um, their financial contributions have been significant in getting us off the ground. And I absolutely must point out that all the contributors on this list are either active institutional fund managers or successful entrepreneurs. And from our standpoint at Texas Venture Labs, this validation from people who know how this kind of system works uh, only reinforces our mission. Uh, secondly, uh, after following Bill Powers' presentation, we're going to go downstairs. Um, one of the things Dean Gilligan has graciously uh, involved us with is we actually have space in this building. Uh, I will point out this is a very nice building, but don't worry, we're in the basement. Um, following his remarks, if you can follow uh, the crowd downstairs, we're going to have both dessert served down there, as well as the people involved with Texas Venture Labs will give you a tour of the facilities. So without further ado, let me bring up Dean Gilligan to introduce Bill Powers. Thanks, Rob. 
I gave Rob the space downstairs, but I didn't give him any money to refurbish it. Uh, you know, we, we wanted a skunk's works feel about the thing, so it looks pretty ratty. Uh, so you all should take note of that. Uh, well, I want to introduce uh, the president of the University of Austin, uh, Bill Powers. Bill has been a big supporter of technology commercialization efforts at the business school and in the engineering school. He's a great big supporter of the production of new science and ideas at UT. Uh, a lot of the symbiotic relationships that Richard was talking about could not have taken place without the support and leadership of the president of the university. So uh, without further ado, please help me welcome Bill Powers to the stage. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the university and, and technology and new ideas and venture capital and some things we're doing. Let me just say, as a first blush, uh, five years ago, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had an event like this. I mean, it just things are happening, and Tom and Rob and just all of you who are, who are part of this. This is, this is a, a, an important part of it, what you're seeing today, uh, but your university is trying to come into the uh, 21st century. And I think we're making a lot of progress, and I want to talk about that, but it's because people have worked on it and, and uh, a, a lot of cross-campus uh, collaboration you heard Rob talk about uh, some of that. The two people sitting here, uh, Tom Gilligan and Greg Fenves, has have been a huge, huge part of that. So I want to thank you for helping us uh, get some momentum going on this. Um, let me just talk uh, uh, briefly about uh, innovation and technology transfer and venture capital from uh, the point of view that we're all looking at it uh, today. And then I want to kind of flip it and, and, and look a little about where the university is in a, in a fairly long historical uh, setting. Uh, the base of uh, technology transfer or venture capital is actually having the ideas, having the research. Um, and the platform here uh, you know, is just rich with that. That's, that's the very good news. Uh, this year, we generated $642 million of new external research to the university. Uh, that happens in our colleges, our schools. Um, doesn't come to the university. It comes into the programs and the scientists and the, and the researchers that are here at the university. Um, but that $642 million uh, among uh, major research universities that do not have a medical school, because that kind of uh, skews the data, we are second in the country, be behind only MIT, and significantly ahead of Cal Berkeley by about $75 million and widening that gap. So the research is going on here, and we're always seeking to improve that, but that's the base, getting more people in the national academies, getting more of the research going on, getting more of the uh, business and, and other innovation going on. So that's kind of the base of that uh, pyramid. And we do uh, quite a bit of what you'd call uh, technology transfer. We have about $16.6 .6 million in licensing fees every year. Uh, that can grow and ought to be a lot bigger, but it's, it's grown steadily over the last uh, decade. Uh, 98 patents were in the top five in the United States in patents uh, issued. Our system, now that does include medical schools, is third uh, in the country in patents, and UT Austin is a big uh, part of that. Um, but there's a lot more we need to do, uh, and, uh, and we're, we're starting the process of doing that. The first thing that I noticed when I was president, or became president almost five years ago now, uh, even the week before, uh, people in my office, and we got to do something about tech transfer. And the first thing I noticed uh, is, number one, let's not be the problem in tech transfer. Let's get out of the way of tech transfer. And I'd hear stories of uh, people who were doing very uh, great things, had a lot of intellectual property, had partners they wanted to get off the campus with, uh, but it was like molasses. Uh, getting off the campus. And so our regents, and they've been very helpful here, just eliminated a lot of 
rules. And so the first thing is just a fast track off the campus. And I think that's helped. And it's helped give a sense to our uh, scientists and innovators and researchers that, uh, you know, come here, we're a little more nimble than we were uh, before. And now the next stage, which is uh, also very important, get, get structures that actually help this process uh, once we've gotten uh, out, of the, uh, out of the way. Uh, Richard Miller uh, that we've hired, things that uh, Dean Fenves is doing uh, in, in, in the College of Engineering, uh, even aside from what we're doing on in the, uh, in the campus. Uh, the Austin uh, Technology Incubator, which has been here uh, for a long time. I just uh, noticed that over its, what, since 1989, so uh, almost, well, a little more than 20 year uh, history, has worked with companies that have raised $750 million in capital. So, you know, all of those things are continuing uh, and we're doing programs like this and, and in engineering. Uh, to continue to uh, see if we can help that process along. And we need your help, we need your ideas uh, to help us do that. I will say the most important thing that has happened on our campus in terms of uh, hooking up with the venture capital and technology transfer and that whole arena is the work that Tom Gilligan and Greg Fenves have started. Uh, there were more silos or more bunkered silos before they came. And that was something we talked about when they came and it, we wanted McCombs to have a bigger footprint on the campus working with people and engineering to have a bigger footprint on the campus. Uh, in the last two years, we've made more progress and it's because you get the right people. And what was it said? Get the right people on the bus and get them in the right seats. Well, we've got the right people on the bus and we've got them in the right seats. So I'm very bullish on uh, the future of this on our campus. And again, it, it takes uh, a village, as they say, it takes uh, us and the uh, venture capital and entrepreneurial community. Uh, one of the other things I'd say that I'm so excited about uh, Venture Labs is that it's involving the students. <clears throat> this is a huge part of our educational process. You know, some students want to go into uh, corporate management, some students want to go uh, into a lot of different areas, but so many want to go into entrepreneurship and, uh, and venture capital, and I think this is going to be a great benefit. We're going to see payoff from this 10 and 20 years from now as the leaders sitting out in uh, groups like this will be, uh, will be coming out of this uh, program. Let me just say, if I could, uh, the, the way I look at it from another perspective, from the university's perspective, uh, even aside from this, sort of at a 75,000 foot level. Uh, we, we can focus on the sort of day-to-day -day issues. We need to get more uh, technology transfer, more of our scientists working with the venture capital uh, uh, industry. And we're going through a very important and painful uh, economic downturn. And we're dealing with all of that. But I think there are more uh, sort of plate tectonic forces at work here. Uh, and kind of a, I hope, interesting story of a place that universities are uh, that is even more significant than the individual issues that we're looking at. <clears throat> you know, if you look at uh, over centuries, sort of where was wealth located and wealth creation located? If you go back to the 15th, 16th century, it's, it's, uh, it's mainly in land. And it's mainly in the agricultural aspects of land. And then you get landowners with uh, streams and rivers and they start damming them up. So owning land with riparian rights made a difference. And you can start making it, you know, using power to make it productive. And then we get factories. Um, and uh, people that own factories were creating the wealth uh, in the country. Well, that has gone to the point where it's ideas now. It's innovation. That's where the wealth creation uh, is. We still have agriculture. We still have mineral production. But a much, much higher percentage of our uh, economic growth and our wealth production uh, is in ideas.
<clears throat> and many of the institutions that we have don't quite map up to that shift. So there's something very deep going on here that we're going to see uh, institutions react to. That's why you see so much work in uh, uh, intellectual property law. Because our intellectual property law was developed over centuries in a common law system and some statutes to deal with things you could hold and put boundaries around. That's no longer the case. So it's not just accidental that there's all this interest in intellectual property law. It's because there's been a shift in where the wealth creation is coming from. Well, our institutions have been very good, but often very slow at reacting to that. Some little seem odd. If you go back to medieval times, early Renaissance times, even things, you know, I'm a lawyer, I, this is where I kind of live, something called the statute of uses. Well, what did it do? It permitted somebody who had legal ownership in a piece of property to sell beneficial ownership or what was called equitable ownership in that piece of property. What that did was let somebody other than the legal owner manage the property. That was a huge and tumultuous and revolutionary legal idea. Think where we'd be if you couldn't have somebody else manage your property. Um, executory contracts, that is contracts that were enforceable, not just you said you would give me that and you didn't, but promises in the future. You know, I'll perform in the future, I'll perform next, next year. That was a revolutionary concept in legal innovation. Uh, the advent of the corporation, both legal and business. Uh, letting people collectivize, collectivize their capital. And then all the spinoffs on that, limited liability corporations, limited liability partnerships. In other words, as the wealth creation and business uh, and scientific communities change, we've changed with them, but often very, very slowly. And slow change probably isn't an option uh, anymore. And just from the point of view of universities, universities have always had to have been tapped in to some wealth creation in the community. Right? Every institution does. It has to have a business model. It has to have a, an income stream. And in the Middle Ages, that was patrons or the church or somebody of that sort. Philanthropy, tuition. Then on the scientific side, the national labs came along and universities started working with the national labs. NSF, National Science Foundation, or NIH, they came along and we got tapped in to them. Industry started doing research and universities got tapped into them. Well now, and over the next 50 years, this engine of economic growth is going to be much more entrepreneurial, much more venture capital. And so these connections we're making are critical, not just for the next five years in technology transfer, as important as that is, but to get universities hooked in with uh, the, the flow of wealth creation in the country. And there is a big problem here. And that's the problem that we all are going to have to face and that you out there in the business world and in the venture capital world and the entrepreneurial world recognize the moment you try and deal with us. The connections that we've been making in the past have been with bureaucratic entities. And we're good at that. Because if nothing else, we are a bureaucratic entity. <laughs> Ask the deans. Ask me. They all think it's coming from me, from the tower. It's coming from everywhere. But it's in our DNA. I'll have an idea. The deans will have an idea. That's a good idea. Let's get that done a year and a half later. It's grinding its way through the bureaucracy, right? And you hear it in Washington. Somebody gets elected as president, they're like, I'm gonna do this and this and this, and they find out. 
You know, bureaucracies are really powerful uh, entities. And they have a survival instinct just like any biological organism has a survival instinct. And there's something actually good at, about that. It creates momentum. It's like a flywheel. Creates momentum to protect against crazy people getting into my position or Tom's position or Greg's position. But it it's inertia. Momentum and inertia go together. Venture capital isn't like that. And I think the real challenge, and these are ways of getting in it, is uh, universities are going to have to become uh, more uh, uh, in tune with the social and wealth creating forces that it is dealing with. And that's going to be a challenge, both immediate and over a long period of time. I think we're going to see the evolution of the university. You're, you're seeing the, the, the surface of it, but it's a result of sort of deep plate tectonics that are going on that have been caused by the fact that now it's ideas and innovation that are the source of wealth in our country. So all I can say to you is we're making progress on that. We've got the right people to continue to make progress on that, and we will continue to make progress on that probably more bureaucratically and slowly than we'd all like. But we will keep it in low gear, and we will keep pedaling. Thank you very much. One of the great things about being in the basement is we kind of fly right into that bureaucracy and just keep on gr grinding away with the entrepreneurs. Uh, on behalf of all the students involved with Texas Venture Labs, we'd like to again thank President Powers, Dean Gilligan, Dean Fenves, and Rob Adams. Their support has been instrumental. We are, we're so excited to continue to do the work that we do, and it feels great to have their support. So again, one more round of applause for them. <laughs> that concludes our lunch. We'd like to invite you downstairs to the basement and to see our, uh, our humble abode and talk with all the different associates. Thanks for coming. <laughs>